So welcome this afternoon to our session, which is going to be looking at exploring the value of sporting heritage. Um, before we start, I thought I'd do a quick introduction. My name is Fran Stovold and I'm the Workforce Development Lead for Sporting Heritage. Um, sporting Heritage is the um, subject specialist network for sporting organisations across the whole of the UK. Um, we support everything from tiny table tennis clubs in your local town through museums, archives, galleries, universities, independent researchers, private collections and everything in between. Um, and we work across all the home nations. Um, if you want to find out more about our work, I'll pop our website in the chat and you're more than welcome um, to explore our website, which is uh, full of resources. I'm hoping that um, the technical uh, setup will uh, be in our favour this afternoon. If for any reason the tech fails at your end, if you just log back in with the details that you've got and I'll keep an eye on the waiting room. Um, if for any reason the tech goes down at my end, I will endeavour to contact everybody and let you know whether we can get everything back up and running within our two hour time frame or whether we need to reschedule, but fingers crossed that won't happen. Um, we are recording the session. I hope you um, saw that in the emails that I sent out before. So you're welcome to turn your cameras on and off as you feel most comfortable with. There's also closed captions enabled for this session. So if anybody um, would like to do that, you can toggle those on and off using the controls at your end. We've got a packed session this afternoon and I hope you're feeling chatty because there'll be opportunities for us to chat but I'm really interested to know about your experience and what you're doing with your projects. Um, I'm also hoping that in return, I'll be able to give you some ideas, hopefully that will build on things that you already know about sporting collections and in particular, obviously in this context, women's football, um, but also bring some new ideas and new ways of looking at the subject as well. Um, I've got a slide deck which we will jump in and out of. Um, as we go through and um, we will have a comfort break halfway through so that as we go into the second hour you won't be sliding off your chairs. Um, I will just thought I'd start with a quick overview of what we're going to look at today. So in this afternoon's session we're going to look at how sporting heritage has been traditionally viewed, the potential of sporting heritage when you're working in your roles and how you can creatively use it to engage audiences, whether you're running workshops, whether you're working, meeting and greeting visitors, whether you're doing gallery tours, and hopefully lots of other applications as well. Um, you'll see as we go through, I've tried to pick um, pictures that uh, fit the subject. So this is an exhibition um, from the Scottish Football Museum, and I think it's part of their exhibition around the Rutherglen, Rutherglen women's football team, which is on at the moment. Right, so already enough from me, I'd really like to know um, about everybody in the room. So if I stop the share, I'd quite like to just do a once round the screen. And if you could just tell me a little bit about how you're involved in the project. Um, I don't know if any of you know each other already, so it'd be quite good for you to share that as well. So Sarah, I'm going to um, come to you first, if that's okay. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Sarah, I work at Milton Keynes Museum. I'm the collections officer. Um, so I've been helping out doing some interviews with current football players um, and we're going to do some show and tell events next month. We're going to try and do some contemporary collecting because at the moment my collection is very much historic sporting and mostly seems to be hockey sticks and tennis rackets from what I can see in the store and certainly nothing women's football related at all. So I want to see if we can start contemporary collecting. I'm hoping to use this as kind of a case study. So yes. see what works for this and then hopefully do it all again with another type of sport or another mm -hmm. aspect of social history. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, Maggie, can we come to you next? Uh, sure. Um, I, I don't know if I'm here under false pretenses or what, but uh, I, I'm, a I'm a volunteer for the um, Women's Euros event in July and we were encouraged to participate in these kinds of uh, workshops just to understand more about the history and the heritage and hopefully to encourage people to participate more so that's me. That's, that sounds perfect I don't think you're, on, you're here under false pretenses at all. Where, sorry where are you based Maggie? Uh, well I'm currently in Florida uh, but, oh. uh, but I do live in Sheffield so um, Two quite different places. Indeed. Yes. 
Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, Asim, can we come to you next? Yeah, I'm the same as Maggie, kind of. I'll be kind of a volunteer at Sheffield because, um, but actually I've just finished my university degree in international tourism management. And um, some, one of my modules is looking at heritage culture, but with more of a tourism aspect. So hopefully that can come into that. I've got some kind of knowledge about general heritage and culture, but I do have a passion in football. So this works for me as a, kind of a, as a great experience to kind of get into the tourism industry as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this, this tournament hopefully will be that that perfect partnership between yeah. the tourism and everybody wanting to come and see the matches. But hopefully through mm. this project, um, yeah. they'll be able to bring out all the heritage. And I know that was the mm. the, the heritage project had quite a, an ambitious um, theme to really address all those sort of preconceptions about women's football and mm. record and capture all that knowledge from previous players and capture the event as it's happening so it, it's quite yeah. ambitious so if you can mm. if you can manage all that that's no no mean feat uh, and marry yeah. it all together <laughs> absolutely no pressure then um david uh, you're well, next on the screen but can i just say i'll be, I'll be based <laughs> in sheffield as, i'll just be based in sheffield as well so you're another sheffield person brilliant okay yeah. sorry david you're next uh right um far from unique i'm in sheffield as well uh, although i am doing the Sort of pre-event event in Rotherham uh, this weekend, mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's a sort of fun event to, to try and encourage people just to engage with the whole Euro. So I am volunteering at the Euros uh, in Sheffield um, when they finally come round. So my background, really, um, as far as women's football is concerned, both my daughters played when they were teenagers in what at the time was quite a pioneering league. It was one of the first leagues, I think, in the country in the, in the modern day anyway, um, and very much in at the foundation stage. Um, sadly, they both succumbed to netball, so um, I actually followed them. Um, I, I am a netball umpire and coach, um, but do have an interest in, in um, football generally. Uh, so I'm just hoping I can bring something to um to the event quite proud of sheffield's heritage with football so um it is apparently the home of it so uh, we'll see what we can yes. do yes oh lovely okay yes we do we do quite a, a lot of work with um england netball and with their archive at heritage key so, oh, okay. um, so i'm very familiar with all the, the, net, the netball heritage as well um rosie do you want to jump in next hi uh um, yeah, I'm Rosie. I work for um, Archives Wigan and Lee. Um, so we're based in Lee, which is in the borough of Wigan. Um, and we are very fortunate in that our um, archives has an exhibition space and we're based out on the Town Hall Square, which is where the sort of pre match parties are going to be happening. Um, so I'm sure Tom will tell you a lot about it as well. But um, we're trying to, much like Sarah, do some sort of contemporary collecting around. Um, women's football in the borough because again it's just we do not have that much um, in the actual archives at the moment so we're trying to encourage people to bring along their stories bring along their objects um, yeah it's going to be very exciting I'm looking forward to July yeah, I think it's going to be yeah it's going to be a fantastic time definitely do you want to pick up where Rosie's left off Thomas yeah hello everyone uh, I work with Rosie as well at the archives um, and as Rose mentioned, you know, we don't have, we have hardly anything relating to women's football. Uh, we have plenty on rugby, being from Wigan and Lee, but uh, nothing on football. So we are really getting into the community and trying to engage with people to, uh, we've been doing oral history interviews, et cetera, to try and get people's memories and, and get those objects in the archives. And then we're looking forward as well to displaying this back to the public as well, so they can learn and engage with it too. Lovely, thank you. So there's quite a spread of experience um, in the room. So I'm hoping that that will give us a, a good mix as we're going through. Um, what I'm going to do, and I hope this isn't too mean, is I'm going to pop you into breakout rooms um, first off, because I'd like you just to have a chat with each other and just talk about only for a few minutes. We'll do it for about five minutes, I think, maybe not even that long. Um, and just I'd like you to just discuss what you think the challenges are going to be with working with the heritage um, that you're collecting. I know that some of you already said you, you're, you're at the beginning of that sort of collecting process. So maybe that's, that's a challenge in itself. But what, what you think the challenges might be and how, especially looking at sort of the interpretation of the subject and what you think visitors might be wanting to sort of know 
what you're wanting to impart, I suppose, as facilitators, whether you're coming from a collections or a volunteer point of view, um, and what you think um, yeah, the visitors might like to know. Um, what I'll do is I'll pop you into two rooms and I'll do a broadcast message, um, which will succinctly sum up what I've just said, because I think I made that quite confusing. Um, and then I'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll just all come back and uh, to talk about it before we leap into the, the next part of the presentation. So lovely, how was that? Very short and sharp, I hope. So mm -hmm. thinking of those questions. So what challenges do people think there would be working with football heritage and in particular women's football heritage? Who would like to jump in? Well, I think for me in terms of like women's football is not as easily accessible compared to men's football because it's not as kind of it's not really as you know it's not I don't want to say it's, it, it, it's not truly global compared to the men's football so I think a lot of people just kind of like our oh, women's football if it's on I'll watch in the background but mm -hmm. they're not really passionate to kind of watch it compared to men's football so I think the culture there's a, there's a kind of there's a culture shift when it comes to both sides of football you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Would people agree with that? Would anybody like to challenge that? I, th I think the, the problem is that, um, and um, this is going to sound very sexist, but it isn't, I think it's entirely relevant, is that, is that a lot of men don't think women's football is proper football. But That's I think nice what thing. they're trying to do, friends of mine, they're trying to compare, you know, they can't imagine women playing men. I said, well, that's not what it's about. That's never going to happen. That's just mm. not going to work. But women against women is a fair competition. Mm. And uh, just saying towards the end of our chat, I mean, I didn't actually watch the men's final at the weekend, but I did watch the women's final because mm. I, I thought it was going to be a better uh, mm. entertainment value. And it is about entertainment at the end of the day. Mm. And I feel quite strongly about this about women's rugby as well now. I think that is much mm. more... But it's, it's just getting that mindset and... And the, the, the danger of the whole heritage thing and the whole sort of awareness thing is, you know, who are we trying to influence here? Are, are we trying to get men to watch women's football or are we just trying to get women engaged with women's football? Mm. And it's both is the answer. But mm. the, the way you do that is going to be different. Um, yeah, it is quite different. So I, I would say that women's football is, sorry, to, to, I'm going to slightly take apart what you said. I, think, I hope that's OK. Women's no, football fine, is, no. is, 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 is played globally. But the coverage of it is not the coverage of it is not equal, and therefore, yeah. and, and I think picking up on what you were saying, David, it's not within so within the sporting arenas, it's not seen as an equal game, and therefore, as a as a viewer, as a as a consumer of football, men's football has so much more publicity, funding, you know, exposure than women's football that it's really hard, and that's why I think your what you said is right, Asim. It's really hard for people to to engage in it because it, it's less accessible in that in that sense mm. so I think yes you've got quite a challenge on your hands to yes change the mindset of men who don't consider and it's not just you know it's not just men obviously who don't consider women's women's football as the proper game but actually it's a game that it's the same game but it's a game in its own right I know lots of men who actually prefer going to watch women's football because the atmosphere and the, the the nature of the game is is different from the men's game although you know in its nuts and bolts sense it's the same it's the same game but they are they are different in many ways so mm. it's it's how you how you convey that and yes when trying to win your audiences round is going to be quite different and that's why we'll, we'll come on to talk a little bit more about audiences did other people have sort of similar feelings or different ideas Um, in our group, we talked about the, the challenges of not having uh, objects to, to mm. display, not having things to, to tangible things to show people um, because of the, the nature of women's football in the past. And it was, you know, seen as very, it was very, like we said, there was a difference between men's coverage and women's coverage. Mm. Um, and then I raised, said, you know, in uh, one of our plans for our temporary exhibition was that we would put a call out for ephemera from the euros this year to to donate to the archives but then i was told that it's it's gone green and it'll be digital tickets and programs um so we will have to think about like a digital archive of mm. material but then again like when people want to look 
a lot of people like to see something in their display case. So it's it's that kind of challenge. Yes, you've got that. You that's that's the challenge in heritage full stop going forward, isn't it? That so many things that we're used to collecting as paper ephemera or or photographic has, has suddenly gone digital. So it's it's a different approach to collecting and displaying. And the value you ascribe to something digital is not always the same as you would ascribe to something that you can physically you've lost that wow of the real item you know it's not the same as being able to pick up a program from the 60s or 70s regardless of the sport but then you know if somebody hands you a or you can see something digitally on the screen is it so it's that's a challenge i think for for us within the heritage sector definitely but yes how you then open up those channels so that people can deposit those items because also digital is seen as so much more disposable as well so people even the, the creators of those digital assets don't ascribe the same value as they would to something that's that's physical. So I think there's there's all sorts of, I think you're right, there's challenges around that. And then the historic issues of not having historic items in your collection. So you've got it at both ends, really, haven't you, historically and, and with your contemporary collecting. But hopefully um, you will find a creative way to solve that. Is there anything else that anybody came up about, uh, talked about around challenges? No. So thinking about what you might want to say as the ones explaining the story of women's football and versus what you think the visitors might want to know. Did you talk about that? Did you have a chance to cover that? We mentioned or talked a little bit about the perception of how long women's football has been going on for. So Maggie was saying that she thought it was fairly relatively recent, but Thomas was saying that they've got records going back to 1895, I think he said. I was paying attention. Um, but there was the ban, and so there was a lot of women that couldn't play football, or certainly we had the Chilton Valley women's team, and they went off to Mexico to play in a cup, I think it was in the 60s. Um, but And the chap that took them had a, was given a lifetime ban for playing football and things like that. So people don't know about it. And it was all suppressed. So it's trying to get across the idea to people that women were playing football for over a hundred years. This isn't a new thing. It's not part of some new feminism fad or movement. Women have been playing football for a very long time. Um, despite I think, that that's, that's, that, that, I think that's a very widely held Sort of misnomer that, that that women's football is far more recent than it actually was i mean with all these ball games men and women have been playing ball games as long as there have been balls to be kicked around and women's football at one stage was as popular if not more popular than than men's football and that partly led into or had a, an influence in in on the ban um and we'll come on to talk about that a little bit so is there anything else that anybody covered before we move on into silence okay right so I thought we'd start this first half of um, the session I thought we'd look at again, continue this idea of looking at sort of challenges and looking at challenges around sporting heritage as a whole but where we can looking at it from a from a football perspective so I'm going to jump back into the slide deck and then we'll sort of I'll sort of talk through and then um, we can chat around things as we go through them so Starting with this one, so I'm not going to uh, insult anybody and work out, try and work out how old everybody is. But when I was growing up, there was an awful lot around football hooliganism, um, and football had particularly the men's game um, at that stage in the sort of 70s and 80s. The the women's game had had no traction in the media. Um, not from my living memory, and I don't know if anybody else remembers watching fo women's football unless it was happening locally. But men's football had this horrible tarnish of of hooliganism. So you had these very sort of negative connotations um, with football. Um, there was never there was very rare that you'd have a a positive story on the main news outside of the sports news around um, football's uh, teams and uh, supporters. They were seen as thuggish. So football had this sort of idea that it was very from a heritage point of view um suffered from this sort of very lowbrow you know it's lowbrow it's it has all these negative connotations it's thuggish why would we want to collect it it's something that sits outside what we're trying to do um, it was associated with criminal elements if you think there's a lot of violence um around and lots of associations around skinheads um 
and also scandal associated not just with football but with with across many many sports I don't know if anybody can think of any sort of sporting scandals that were going on when they were growing up anybody think of any that were that they're familiar with well the one I can think of or this is not to do with football but generally there's been something called something gate so any scandal linked to like a certain topic has been called you know in rugby or some, there's the famous blood gate or in mm. football there was the um there was the actual kind of there was there was Hillsborough and then there was Heisel in in it was Liverpool that was mm. the major that was the major two kind of disasters I would say football football disasters I would say Yes, I had I had definitely had Hillsborough down on, on my list as you know, terrible disasters, huge mm. losses of life. Um, mm. looking at across other um areas of sport, obviously there's been scandals both within football and gymnastics around child abuse, there's been drug mm. taking and cycling and athletics. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the thing that football and many, many other sports are trying, including cricket actually recently, have been trying to address is all the issues around racism. So it's mm. it's very easy to find these negative connotations around sport that hit the main headlines outside of you know the sporting um, reporting but you can see why museums and galleries and archives and heritage organizations haven't it hasn't been something that's been naturally collected because it has this sort of or has the potential to have this sort of negative connotation associated also, with can Sorry, I just yes, say then? yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I just want to say also in football there's been the actual the kind of corruption within mm. the kind of the away from FIFA but we don't know if it's truly been, you know, you know, is, it, is there still like some cover up behind that? You don't know. I don't think we'll ever get to. And the, well, yes, there's all the sports washing, isn't there? That's been in the news mm. recently with the purchasing of places like Newcastle uh, um, with with the money that's come in there and also to some extent Manchester City. So there's there's the, it's never far from um, controversy um, for whatever reason. So I say this is sort of the lowbrow element of sports, which I think football, the men's game particularly, has suffered from. And I think by association, the fact that men's football hasn't always been collected, women's football hasn't really stood a chance in that sense. Then you get the other end of the scale where some sporting activities are considered too highbrow. Obviously, over the last, gosh, in the time I've been working in museums, 15, 20 years, museums have become much more community focused. You need to reflect your audience. You need to be accessible in all senses of the word. And some sporting activities are considered, you know, quite elitist. You know, if you think of countryside pursuits, the hunting, shooting, fishing side of things, you need um, something that's going to uh, cost money to be involved in. It might not be that relevant to those who are living in cities or in urban populations. It's something that they can't necessarily connect with. Um, or it's seen as, you know, traditional in the sense that it's old fashioned and no longer relevant. You know, museums are always being pushed to be relevant with their collections so that you're speaking to your audiences. I'd just like to say in, in defense of traditional sports, that this, this image is one of a beautiful collection at the British Sporting Art Trust and in no way are they, are they not relevant. Um, they have an absolutely fantastic and beautiful collection um, in Newbury and they're based near, uh, co they're co-located with the National Horse Racing Museum. Um, but so sometimes sporting heritage has sort of fallen between those two stools. It's either considered too highbrow or it's considered too lowbrow. And football um, has definitely sort of erred towards that sort of more lowbrow, lowbrow end. Um, you know, why would you want those sorts of people, the people who, who are linked to those negative connotations? Why would you want them in as your audiences? Um, so I think, yeah, it'd be fallen between two, uh, two stools on that front. There's also the other view that, you know, for lots of people, sport is just something they played at school or it's something that you do with your children or that it's not necessarily relevant for an adult uh, audience. If you're trying to um, put on something that's going to be relevant to a broad sector of your audience, and this is going to be a wide sweeping generalisation in which I put myself in the middle, sometimes if you curatorial staff may feel that they're, you know, that the sport, a sports topic is not going to be as inclusive as maybe a social history topic is. I'm hoping that as we go through this uh, session, you'll see how you can weave um, social history and all sorts of other aspects into the coverage of a sporting topic. Is it something that's only for heroes? I've got my statues here that are all on pedestals. You know, it's very easy to put sporting players 
you know, the, the, the elite sporting players as, as on pedestals and thinking that you could only really, people are only really interested in the top players. They're not interested in, you know, Bob Smith, who plays down the road. Um, they're only interested in, you know, the, the David Beckhams or the Ronaldos or the, you know, whoever you might pick. Um, if you're picking women's uh, football players, maybe somebody like Mia Hamm or somebody, you know, like that. Um, so therefore, if you've not got that in your collection, you know, if you've not got a, a star of the sport in your uh, town or in your region, why would you cover it? You know, is, is it worth the effort of going to collect collecting that material when you're not sure if people are going to be interested? Is it only for the elite sports? Are you only looking to cover, you know, sport at its professional level? So again, if you don't have that in your area, then sometimes sport just doesn't get collected. It doesn't get collected at grassroots level, when actually this grassroots sport is a really, really rich topic. And also this is something we've touched on already. Is it something that's only uh, either involves the men's game or is only of interest to men? And if you cover something outside of the men's game, is it going to be dismissed? Um, I know that when we first started working on this project, I was telling some friends about this and a, a, a friend rather dismissively said, oh, so you're doing a project about birds football. And I said, no, I'm doing a project about the UEFA Women's Euros. It's a different thing. Um, you know, don't be so dismissive. You know, it's really patronising. It's really condescending, but it's really hard to change some of those views. You know, and particularly in this project where we've got quite a short run up for you to collect and interpret collections. Um, for your audiences, it, you know, it takes a long time to, to change, to make those sort of attitudinal changes. So, thinking of all those things that might have hampered the collection of sporting heritage, and some of them will feed into the challenges you will have when working with your sporting collections, whether it's through events or your collections, or whether you, you're just talking to visitors who are coming in um, through the Euros competition. How would you fit sporting heritage into your collections and displays? So quite often organisations haven't necessarily collected because they think it should be something else that's been collected. So maybe this might be one of the reasons why you don't have a huge amount in your collection, Sarah. Maybe people felt that it should go, should go somewhere else. And I think that's quite a common um, feeling that it should either sit with a sports specific museum or collection or it should sit with a club. Sometimes things are collected but not displayed because people don't necessarily understand how to display them. Not that sport is a, a foreign language by any means. And I'm sure we've all worked with collections or gone to events where you don't always have to fully understand the topic. You can either read up about it or research about it. I know coming from a, a collections point of view myself, every time I go and work with archaeology, I have to go and read around the subject. It doesn't matter how many times I work with it. I still have to go and read up because my knowledge of stones and bones is uh, fairly thin, but it's all out there to be had. But sometimes it's to do with the confidence within the organisation or the confidence within the collections team or the learning team. Um, that if the confidence isn't there, sometimes those items will sort of languish in the stores and sort of get forgotten about and therefore the collections don't get added to. Um, or if they do come out, they come out in isolation. So we are going to do an exhibition about this sport and we're not going to link it to any of the other collections because we're just going to display it sort of in, a, in aspic almost. So you fail to make those links where you can see how it, it weaves in with other, other parts of people's lives. And I'm hoping that through the work that's happening with the Women's Euros, that some of those richer themes will come out, particularly when if you talk to... Um, Sorry, did you say you've already, is it you've already, you've already spoken to some of players already around the women's Euros? Were they previous, were they players, previous players? Can't get my words out. Uh, we've done both. So we've spoken to a lot of grassroots players, um, women that are saying they've got quite an active series of different groups and ways that women can get involved in football in Milton Keynes. We've spoken to a lot of those. Um, mm. I know my colleagues at the Living Archive have been doing some film recordings with old players, particularly those mm. that have been out and went to Mexico as well. Mm. And we've got contact with one lady that plays for Milton Keynes first team as well, and also okay. coaches at grassroots level, so we've been able to talk to her too. That sounds like a really good spread. I think I met one of your colleagues from the, the, the Living 
archive uh, on one of the previous training sessions and she was talking about having recorded some of the players. So yeah, so they were trying to encourage, particularly from a sporting heritage point of view, we always try and encourage people not to display sport in isolation and to look at how you can link out to the wider agendas and wider topics. And I'm hoping that that's what we can explore a little bit more through this session. So the downside when historically if people or traditionally if people haven't uh, collected and displayed sporting heritage, people don't feel that comfortable donating material because if you don't if you don't see it in people's displays you don't realize that uh, that organization might be collecting so that's when it sort of becomes a little bit of a vicious circle because if you don't see it in somebody's displays you then would look to give your material somewhere else or you keep it in a box under your bed and then when you know if you need to it happens so often either when people pass away or they downsize their house they think oh well, this was you know items from my past nobody's interested in this and things get disposed of so particularly from women's sport lots of material gets lost from the historical record I mean women's sport is not the only area but it's particularly prevalent within women's sport because women's lives move on it's considered either it's not understood by family members or it's not collected by the club they haven't seen it uh, displayed in a local museum or archive or understand that that those sorts of organizations would describe it value it quite often gets disposed of and then there's a gap left in the historical record about that person the club they played for the people they played alongside or the flip side is they donate it to a, a sport specific collection so what i'm wanting to argue this afternoon and i hope that as you're all involved in the project that this is something um, that we will all agree on is that the potential that sport can be a real golden thread um, that runs through uh, lots of uh, different aspects. It doesn't exist in isolation. It, and then we, we can see how it weaves through the lives of individuals and communities and organizations so at all different levels um, and I hope that will come out in some of the the, the contact you have with some of the, the female players and that you know you don't have to be yeah you don't have to be a player to have a link with sport and it sounds like you've you obviously talked to quite a few people Sarah I don't know if other people have come into contact already with people who've had different connections with the sport um, there's so many different roles. I know that we were talking in one of the previous sessions about how to um, connect um, with people who've coached, people who've worked in the back room, people who might have washed the kit or made the teas or driven the minibus or maintained the ground or sold tickets or sold programmes or ran the bar or just were a fan and went along on a Saturday or were an armchair fan and watched it on the telly if that was ever possible or read it in the newspapers. There's so many different ways um, that you can be involved in sport. It could be that, you know, you speak to people who just live near the ground, who remember the atmosphere on a match day, you know, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, you know, maybe it was noise that disturbed their peaceful Saturday afternoon or whether it was something, you know, that they really enjoyed. Um, when I was at university, I worked behind the bar at Main Road in Manchester when uh, City was still there. And I'd never been to a football match before. And I was absolutely amazed. Obviously, it was the men's game. But I was absolutely amazed when we were allowed to go up and actually watch part of the game in between um, having to serve. Um, and just the absolute atmosphere, I was just absolutely blown away. So that that is something that, you know, is really difficult to replicate in any other field of um, activity. So I'm hoping that we will show as we go through this what a golden thread sport can be. Al? Yeah, I can hear it. Brilliant. Second time lucky then. Sorry, that's me. I think heritage, um, unless it starts to disappear, isn't valued as much as it should be. 
mainly I think because we're all busy trying to deal with austerity and delivering our services, our, our opportunities within a tighter and tighter resource pack. Uh, it's only when they start disappearing that we start to wish we hadn't let them go. Sporting heritage is probably the most emotional type of history and feeling of belonging that most people can experience outside a sort of dramatic life event. And that's what makes sport so special because you feel the ups and downs of the sporting occasion. It wasn't just about a game, it was a community coming together to celebrate the achievements of their city and, and their club and, and that image of, of 25,000 plus Bradford City fans at Wembley Stadium is just something that is on my mind forever. Whilst the playing of the game, whatever it is, is incredibly important and gives people that sense of belonging. It's as much about what sport itself represents in society and in life itself that makes sporting heritage so important. It's really about bringing people together. And through those stories, either supporting them with a health outcome, with a physical activity out outcome, with an educational outcome. So, you know, it's often a platform from which people will engage with something either learn about their history or develop themselves as people. It's obviously been proven that it's really useful, particularly in the treatment of degenerative brain diseases. So we work with organisations like Sporting Heritage and Sport and Memories Network in order to use heritage to make a positive impact on people's lives. The other thing about Sporting Heritage, if we put it under that label, is that sport will actually bring people into engage with other sort of cultural forms. Uh, so you'll get people who are fanatic football fans but would probably never visit an art gallery until there's an exhibition of football paintings or football you know, visual representation. And it's the same with the other sports. Our exhibition at Wakefield, we know from talking to visitors that some of them said they've never been before, they wouldn't have come, but they're interested in sport. Whatever industry you're in, whatever sport you're in, um, you can only learn from the past. And, you know, one of the one of the most important things moving forward in sport is embracing the past and work out ways of involving and embracing heritage. Whereas we're not just looking at football or uh, tennis as, as separate identities, we have to look at it as sporting heritage under that title. So it's all sports, all inclusive. I think it's up to us in the industry to make sure that when we are developing new facilities, new assets, we embed that history and that story into those new facilities. I don't think as a sector we've always engaged with it enough. Um, we need to do more because <laughs> it is so popular and we're missing a trick, I think, if we don't engage people with it. Right, so I hope second time lucky, um, everybody was able to hear that. And uh, um, I, as I was trying to say before, <laughs> when, I, when I thought you'd heard it before, that in a nutshell, it, it sums up all those little threads that I hope that we can pull together as part of this Women's Euros project. You know, it's about um, bringing people together. It's about what the sport represents outside of, you know, the offside rule and the stats and who won what and how, you know how that person played it's 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 the the, the social side that, that comes through it's about that sort of personal development and that feeling of sort of community that people feel as they come through sport and also as the the younger girl was saying it's the opportunity to get people to engage with sport in a in a heritage and cultural setting which they might not have done before you know she's absolutely right you know we're missing a trick by not engaging with uh, those uh, sporting collections. So I hope that's what's going to sort of underpin a lot of what we talk about today. Right, let me just move us on. Where's my cursor gone? There we are. So continuing the idea that sport is our golden thread, it does bring people together. It brings people together who possibly have not much else in common. You think of, you know, if you look at a, a full football stadium as hopefully, um, we will have all the way through the women's Euros competition. There'll be people there who ostensibly have very little in common apart from their love of the game. It's very rare for that to happen in such great numbers outside of a sporting occasion. Obviously, it divides people. Sport is very tribal, um, but it's that bringing together of people so you have that feeling of family and community. And it creates this shared experience, you know, so you, people can sort of put aside their differences 
if they have a love of a team or a love of a sport. So again, it's, it's, it's quite unusual for that to happen outside of a, a sporting occasion. And it stirs up strong emotions. Um, you can just see that when you, when you watch sports and watch people, actually it's more interesting watching the um, audiences watching sport, you can see that. So I've come up with a few here. So I've come up with pride, determination, conviction, and uh, a sense of place. Definitely, you know, people feel very proudly and strongly about the teams where they come from. I don't know if there are other um, sort of ideas and emotions that you think we could add to that list. Anybody want to jump in with any other ideas? I'd say it linked with the, the sense of place is that sense of identity as well and, and belonging. Mm. Um, as part of, you know, the wider themes of place that, you know, you could move to a different town, but you can easily get involved in the community um mm. through that that shared experience mm. yeah definitely and also the idea of, of moving away if you move away sometimes you take that that sort of love of the game with you and the love of that team you think of all the players I mean I suppose teams like Manchester United are sort of the best example so many supporters I would have thought probably 90% of the supporters for Manchester United don't live in Manchester do they, they you know they've got this global law I suppose the other one that I would add is loyalty you know, people have a very, very strong affinity to their teams, not that they won't get involved in things in their, their hometown. I'm based in Brighton, so I, lots of people I know here both support the Albion down here, but also have other affinities, you know, to other teams across the country. But because we're here and you can go and see the Albion, you know, people have season tickets to come and watch the team here. So it's that really strong sense. Also, the, 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 the word that quite often crops up when we speak to, to sporting fans is that sort of sense of family. So it's not only community, it's family. Um, picking up on that family theme, the lady in the picture here is a lady called Anne Swanson. Um, and she was uh, heavily involved in the family uh, liaison and making sure that families were made for, to feel welcome at Watford Football Club. Um, and sadly, she passed away not that long ago. Um, and as a result, they've named a stand after her. So there's all sorts of ways, going back to this idea that people are involved in sport in lots of different ways and are sort of remembered and their heritage carries on. So her work will live on and her memory will live on because they've had a stand named after her. So the Anne Swanson family stand um, and they have a real family following. And I know that both the men's and I think the women's game, as we were saying earlier on, particularly lends itself to this really well, having that really welcoming um sense and the men's game i think have tried harder to make it a more family friendly event but i think the women's game particularly does it um really really well and hopefully that was something that will come out across the the women's euros um competition fran is it okay if i just jump in about the the family side of it because i think in terms yeah, of, of like in terms of like the actual the women's side um they've actually made it more family friendly with the ticket price has been low lower compared to the men's game mm. so i think that's something that's more that's why a lot of people go to women's games now because the prices are much more cheaper and obviously mm. just like yeah for, for yeah for like a yeah for like a season ticket for like a, about i think about i think arsenal is about 70 pounds that's what i've heard about from the women's mm. game but compared compared to the men's it's like like triple <laughs> like triple quadruple yeah. of the price so that's why that's what the women's game they've done that quite well i believe and i hope hopefully the men can learn from that and hope they can start to you know freeze their prices or cut their prices to a lower or to a more acceptable level but yeah i just oh, i'd in. love it if they did that in the men's I know, game but I think it's it's <laughs> yeah I, I think i think the men's game is well both both are commercially astute aren't they you know you have to go mm. with whatever the market will support and obviously the men's market will support those higher costs but it's yeah. obviously a very commercially astute um approach from the women's game to welcome yeah. families to bring their you know to bring you know that that family group because you know if mm. you go and watch matches as a child there's more likelihood that you will go and watch matches as an adult so therefore you're automatically creating that loyalty yeah um, and for, from and from our point of view you're creating that heritage and those memories that hopefully mm -hmm. in years to come we will be able to capture um, yeah. to tell the story of, of those teams. But yes, thanks very much for that. No problem. <laughs> so moving on to why we should be looking to collect um, sporting heritage. I think we've, we've just started to touch on this already. It helps you develop your audiences. So 
um, as it's saw in the film, sports fans quite often aren't your natural audience in cultural institutions. It's quite a wide sweeping generalization, but quite often um, a core of sports fans will probably never have walked through the doors of um, your museum or archive unless you've got a sports specific show on. It helps you bring in you know, audiences in a family group as well. So you, you know, there's, there's sort of all different ways that you can approach it. And as part of Sporting Heritage, we've done a bit of research there. Um, you can see the report there about trying to understand who the who the audiences are for sporting collections. And we're, we're very much at the beginning of trying to understand how you marry sport within a heritage context and how you find the audiences for that. So it's a piece of work that we're working on. But um, if you're interested in that sort of research um, side of it, um, you may want to go and have a look at that report. I say it's, it's definitely the perfect way to bring in non-traditional audiences in and I'm hoping that there'll be lots of people coming to your events and exhibitions um, who will be new users for you. We've talked about the loyalty and the, and the, the fans, the, you know, the, the power of a fan is, is can't be um, underestimated but fans are often fans of other sports as well so you won't just be appealing to football fans, you'll be appealing to, to fans of sport as a whole. And this is something that one of my colleagues, um, a gentleman called Richard Mabriarty, who uh, runs the Scottish Football Museum, they realised, so they've done a whole series of reciprocal sporting exhibitions within the Football Museum to encourage other sporting fans to come in. So they've had exhibitions on cricket and on tennis and all sorts of other sports. And they've, they've had this sort of reciprocal sharing of audiences, which I thought was quite a clever way, because if you're interested in one sort of sport, it's quite a natural leap that you're going to be interested in another and you, you support each other. And it is that sort of loyalty element that they were pulling on to bring more audiences through their doors. There's also a lot of work being done around female fans at the moment. Um, my colleague, Sarah Priestley, who's the curator at Watford Museum, has been working with the Women of Watford, which is uh, a group that's been going for a relatively short period of time. But it's, it's been recognised that women fans are uh, a group of their own. And I'm hoping that there'll be more female fan groups sort of set up as a result of uh, the women's um, Euros competition. Um, so they have a whole different dynamic outside of uh, traditional male fan groups. So there's a growing sort of heritage collection around fans and fan memories. And I thought I'd just sort of suggest a couple of archives. So the Red Archive um, looks at fan memories around Liverpool. Um, it's the male game, but it looks at all different fan perspectives. Um, and there's some lovely uh, films and recorded uh, histories on there. And also people contributing their memorabilia. So if you're looking at the sort of ephemera or items that you might want to collect, it might be worth looking at the sort of things that they've collected and seeing if there are any parallels um, to your work. The other one is the Fans Museum, which is actually based in Sunderland, but it's it's quite, I was quite interested in when I came across them because they're for fans of, of sport in general, particularly football, but they're, they're, they are the Fans Museum. So it's about a fan in its own right, as opposed to a fan with its key allegiance to a particular club. So there's definitely a whole wealth of information and material out there within sort of the fan um, base, but how you translate that and how you access that and tap into it, whether you tap into it through loans or, or whether you can persuade people to donate, the material's out there, but it's, it's brokering that relationship um, with that group, I think. Has anybody spoken to groups of fans as part of their project yet? As opposed to players? Is it, is it on anybody's list to speak to fans as opposed to players? Yeah, we want yep. to take like, all histories um, from like, a wide range of people and fans are definitely on our, on our list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. Right, moving on. So what we love about sporting heritage, quite often we talk about this, uh, it crops up really regularly, is it's a fantastic way to challenge perceptions. So we started off this session with those negative connotations about sport. Sporting heritage and the, some of the things, the topics that we've touched on already, the fantastic way to challenge that. 
you know, football is not, and particularly the women's game, as we, we've said, it has, is miles away from many, many of those negative connotations that we started off with football. You know, it's not lowbrow. It's not highbrow and elitist, even though we have professional women players now. It's something that has that real strong community feel going all the way through it. But also within a heritage sector, you can challenge other, oh, you can challenge other um, preconceptions of what you as an organization might be interested in collecting. So there's all sorts of um, discussions around, you know, what is art and what is fashion. As part of Sporting Heritage, we ran in February, the Art of Sporting Heritage Month. Um, it's the first time we had looked at art, uh, visual art we started off with, across sporting um, genres. And we looked at everything from fanzines to um, you know, traditional painting to um, sketches and blogs and everything in between. And you know, it was interesting what people would consider was art and wasn't art. And people had some quite entrenched views and actually we, it prompted a lot of discussion about what you should be collecting. And you know, does it have that cultural weight and should it be coming into your collections? And actually, I think we, you know, we actually threw the net quite widely. And you get the same with, you know, are football kits fashion? Are they, you know, are they worthy of being in your collection? Well, if you look at, um, at the National Football Museum, they did a whole uh, exhibition that links to the design of kits and how kit design has really changed and how lots of kit design is now commissioned fantastic um, exhibition which I think is still up to see on their website so you can really sort of challenge people's perceptions around that so yes what's culturally significant people won't if they particularly if they've not seen this sort of material in your organization before you are in that position of power to give it the weight to say that actually we really value this and um, we not only value these as items but we value the stories and we value you know, you as a group of people, as individuals and as a, a community, you know, we, we ascribe that value to you. It, it's that strange power you have as somebody who works within the heritage sector. It makes it sound as though we're, we're wielding all sorts of power. But you know what I mean? You can, by just by being within probably a slightly more formal setting than people are used to seeing sporting heritage, you are automatically saying, you know, we, we um, value these items. It's also showing, going back to that idea of sense of identity and, and creating that sort of sense of place, what is important to your town and your um, or your city, particularly, you know, since we're based across nine host cities um, for the Euros, there's a real opportunity to, to hone in to what's important to your individual location. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting way to, to look at it. And then we've got one more thing and then we will have a break. Now, I don't know if anybody knows um, or has read any of her books, Chimamanda and Goetzi Adichie. I don't know if anybody's read any of her stuff. She's done a fantastic TED talk, um, which I would highly recommend. It's about 15 minutes long and it's about the danger of the single story. And again, I think this is something that Sporting Heritage and particularly looking at all the different people that you could engage with around um, the football and, and the women's Euros um, is looking at one event from lots of different perspectives. So her TED talk talks about the danger of the single story. When she came over um, from, oh gosh, I want to say Nigeria, um, and I apologise greatly if I've got that wrong. When she came over to study in the States and she had a, a roommate at college, her roommate expected her to have no knowledge of American music to eat quite uh, basic food because her narrative of people who came from Africa was that they were poor and un uneducated and had a, a poor grasp of language and you know that they were very sort of not quite primitive but they were definitely not as advanced as Americans because that was the single story she had only ever heard of people who came from Africa um, regardless of which country they came from across the continent that was the one story that she had so she was she talks sort of very eloquently better than I'm managing um, about breaking down those stereotypes and saying that actually there's lots and lots of different aspects to everybody and every community and I think that works really well for sporting heritage and particularly bearing in mind you're going to have matches where you've got two teams playing 
So you've got two different perspectives on one uh, one match. You've got you know the fans. You've got the, all the behind the scenes. You've got the television. You know how it's reported in the media. So you can you can almost do this sort of almost three hundred and sixty degree assessment, or you know you can record that one moment in time or that one match from lots of different perspectives. So you're getting away from this idea that the story of that match is just, you know, the end result or who goes through onto the next leg. So, but I'd really recommend going and looking at her, her TED talk, um, particularly from a curatorial point of view. It's really interesting looking at how you can sort of have that multiplicity of voices and making sure it's, it's that great way to in, make sure everybody's included, but having that balance in, in what you're talking about. I'm going to stop the slide deck. Oh, actually, I think, just check, yeah. That's about half time. I'm going to stop the slide deck there. So we've covered quite a lot of ground in that first just over an hour. Has anybody got any questions before we have a bit of a break? Um, I hope that was long enough to give you a little bit of a break. Um, in, so in that first half, so we've looked at challenges of working with sporting heritage, some of the things that, you know, hopefully will um, help and support you with um, your approach to collecting. I think sometimes when you know what the challenges might be and obviously you're, you're aware of some of them already those you know when you're looking at doing some contemporary collecting or looking at trying to reach out to to groups that you've not worked with before um when you know them you can start thinking and doing that bit of problem solving and working out how you can get what you need for your events or displays um or, or histories depending on how you're approaching it then we looked at yeah look at some of those negative perceptions around sport and then just trying to turn that on its head and showing how sport can really be the sort of golden thread that can run through people's lives. So that sort of sums up our, our first half. In this second half, um, I thought I would just run through a whole raft of examples of how we quite often work with sporting heritage and just show how it can link out to other themes. Um, so hopefully this will give you um, either build on ideas uh, and things that you already know, or hopefully um, provide you with some new ideas and new ways to take um, the use of sporting heritage and obviously in this case um, women's football in the work that you've got coming up over the next couple of months. So the things they're going to look at um, is how football can be sort of the lens through which you can explore other topics um, and I've split them broadly into four areas. The role of women, com uh, community cohesion, excuse me, equality, diversity and inclusion, and health and well-being. So we're going to start at the top with the role of women. So football, and particularly if you're talking to any of the players who played right up until sort of the 70s and 80s, and you know you could argue that it's still re relevant now, it, it really gives you the opportunity to explore how the role of women has changed over that period. So we ran um, a brilliant session around oral history questioning with Dr. Gary James, who I know is involved with um, either the Salford or Manchester um, project. He is an experienced oral historian and has done a lot of work with Manchester City women. And he gave us an insight about how he talked to players about how they fitted in um, going to practice and going to matches if they still needed to get the dinner on the table or they needed to get the kids out the door to school or they had work to go to. And obviously at that time, they were they were not you know on you know there was no such thing as a, a professional contract for women so how you get the time off you know did you have to pay to go and practice or did you have to pay to go to matches and if so did you have to choose which you went to if there wasn't enough money to go around so it gives you all these opportunities to explore how sport can fit into somebody's life when um, particularly with women's football up until relatively recently it was still women and football weren't you know natural bedfellows so you can look at areas around marriage around motherhood and family life the story that he gave us is that that one one of the, the female players that he spoke to um they always used to play on a sunday so she used to cook the whole roast dinner get up really early cook the whole roast dinner have it ready by nine ten o'clock in the morning go out and play come back then you know because she felt it was her her part of her role as a mother and as a wife to you know to feed everybody which is entirely you know her choice but very much the sort of prevailing attitude in, in sort of the 70s um so that then she could come back heat it all up and you know have the dinner on the table for everybody when she got back 
Um, she did that because she really, really wanted to play football. But then she also, you know, it's, it's those trying to balance those two aspects of her as a person. Working life, as I say, you know, women often had to take time off or use their holiday so that they could go and play or couldn't play because they, they weren't able to do either of those things. Obviously, as time has gone on, and particularly since the lifting of the ban, there's been uh, incremental professionalisation of the game. But even in the lifespan of those who will be playing in the tournament now, there will have been great leaps forward around, you know, terms and conditions of playing, all the sponsorship that sits behind it. We touched on this a little bit already around sort of prejudice and sexism, and I'll come on to talk a little bit more about it. And that sort of equality of opportunity. So many of the women that um, you will speak to, particularly um, those, I say, who played sort of in the 70s and 80s, will have been discouraged from playing at school, but will have actively played in their spare time or played with grassroots teams. <coughs> Excuse me. But going back to something we touched on right at the beginning, talking about how long the game has been running for, um, football was particularly in, uh, popular during the Victorian period. Um, and then uh, there were some real pioneer players in the early 20th century. And I don't know if anybody's come across Lily Parr before. Um, she was scouted for a very famous female team called the Dick Kerr Ladies team. Um, she was a very gifted uh, player. She was an attacker and a prolific goal, goal scorer. She scored over a thousand goals during her career. Um, she was born in 1905, but was still playing in 1951, um, encouraging other women to keep going and playing. So she played right the way through that period when football was banned. She was, an op she was openly part of the LGBTQ, uh, LGBT community. Um, and if you have a look on the National Football Museum website, um, there's, uh, she was the first woman to be inducted into their Hall of Fame. Um, and there's a great BBC sports film about her as a pioneering football player um, and, and how that links into uh, all areas around pride. But so there, there will be other women that you speak to who have been real pioneers in the game, whether that's within their local team, within their local community, they've changed something that has pushed the game forward. Um, either for them as people or, or broadly. So there's a real opportunity to look at sort of women as pioneers. I think I've got one other pioneer uh, example here. And actually this is one of my sporting heritage, uh, former sporting heritage colleagues, Julia Lee. So this is a rugby league example. Um, I don't know if any of you are rugby league fans and have come across Julia before. Um, she wasn't allowed to play rugby league as a child or growing up and somebody dared her she got, I got dared for a fiver, Fran, she said, um, to go and train as a referee when she was 17. Um, she went on to work her way up through all the games and became the first woman to referee the men's game and then the first woman to referee men's game professionally, both in this country and out in Australia and New Zealand. And she, nobody has surpassed her record even to this day. She retired in 2000 because unfortunately she became injured. Um, as part of a game, uh, but then she has continued her life in sport. <coughs> Excuse me. Went on to work for the Rugby Football League. And in the last six months, has just, sec just secured £90,000 worth of Heritage Lottery funding to go back and look at other female uh, rugby league players who weren't capped. They started capping the men at a much earlier date than they capped the women. So there's a whole run of women, lionesses, who've never been capped. So she's been working to get them capped and get their stories recorded. But the reason why I've included Julia, even though she's not a football example, is to show that, you know, you may speak to players, but they may, just because their playing career has finished, it doesn't mean that their career or their love of the sport has. It will, it will change and evolve as their lives change and evolve. And I think that's you know, particularly true of women, that they, if they have a love of something, it will, it will continue in another form. Um, and Julia is just a good example of that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so there's a little bit of information about her Lionesses project, um, which I think is running over the next two years. It'd be fantastic to see all those Lionesses properly capped and recognised. So we've touched on this a little bit. So the ban came in in 1921. In the run up to the ban, some of the uh, female football matches, women's football matches, were getting anywhere between 40 and 50,000 um, attendees. In, in many cases, um, or you know, definitely in some cases, were more popular than the men's game. But 
the football association football association came out saying that it was unsuitable for females and the game was banned it's really difficult to really assess you know to underestimate or you mustn't underestimate rather the impact that this had on the development of the female game and again i'm sure this will come out with people that you speak to it slowed down the professionalism of the game it's it really impinged on female players ability to train obviously if you were a coach for the fa you were penalized if you uh, or given a lifetime ban i think that's you were talking about that was that what you a point that you made david that you know people get if you taught while the ban was on you would then get an fa ban yourself so obviously people didn't want to risk that and it affected the types of contracts that women were given so just that one thing of banning the game and that ban lasted does anybody know when the ban ceased quick pop quiz date off the top of your heads was it in last december, december just gone no it was look a bit further back than that it was 1971 uh, so we just had we just celebrated 50, 50 years of the anniversary yeah. yeah that's that's what you would have heard about um last year yeah. so i mean it lasted for a, a you know a long a long time it you know effectively you know if you it could be somebody's whole playing career that that length of time so looking even though the ban is lifted looking at some the ways that some women are treated um, within sports. Uh, I don't know if you recognise this lady. This is um, Ada Hagerberg. Mm -hmm. um, she was awarded the Ballon d'Or, which is the prize that's awarded by the uh, French um, France football. And when she received her prize, the uh, presenter asked her if she would like to twerk in celebration. Um, to which there was an absolute uproar. She she handled it very modestly and said that, you know, she's been very diplomatic in her interviews and said, oh, I didn't really, it didn't even occur to me at the time. You know, obviously it's not something I would do. You know, so here she was being recognised for her professional sporting ability. She was recognised as the best female footballer of that year. And yet she was asked to do something which is, you know, got sexual connotations, is quite demeaning for women. Um, and there was a, a massive backlash against it. So it, it's just looking out for even now, there are elements where women are, are treated in a way that wouldn't be you know, equal to the way that men have been treated. And lots of people called it out, but I quite liked this quote from Andy Murray, which I won't read out because you can read it on the screen, but he's basically saying this, saying you know, this still happens a lot and it's not the sort of thing that would have, you know, a male player wouldn't have been asked the same. So, you know, it doesn't seem unreasonable for female players to be asked, you know, to be treated equally or equitably. This is a slightly older example. Um, we recently, as part of Sporting Heritage, we recently ran a webinar, which is up on our YouTube channel. That's the link to it. Um, an in conversation piece with Laurie Hoey, who played for Fulham um, in one of the years when they won the Women's FA Cup. And this is one of uh, her colleagues, um, Carrie Staley. And when, when they'd won, the photographer asked Carrie to lie down on the pitch. And you can see from that picture how muddy the pitch is and you know to, to adopt that sort of pose but she doesn't look terribly comfortable but he obviously wanted her to adopt a slightly sort of alluring pose and he even asked her for the sake of the photograph bearing in mind this has been reproduced in black and white if she put some red lipstick on to which thank goodness she said no but it's that sort of treatment that you know women are still you know sort of slightly dolly birdish and this is sort of um, in the late 70s early 80s so it's that expectation of what media and you know society as a whole expect of, of female sports players um if you watch that webinar there's also some um footage that laurie had saved of when they won the their um fa cup and there's a, a short section which is reported on itv of them in the baths afterwards all fully clothed all still in their kit jumping around splashing just general having celebrations and just as you cut away from the clip the ITV presenter says, oh, I think we cut away from that a little bit too quickly, sort of intimating that there might have been something salacious that you might have just missed. And, you know, now it clangs really badly. But at the time, it was just, you know, Laurie said, oh, we didn't even notice it at the time. But again, it's those how that expectation or how women, even at the height of their sporting prowess, um, have been have been treated. And when you look at sort of the 
Carrie's experience and Laurie's experience and then compare that to somebody like Ada Haderberg, who, you know, 20, 30 years later, she's still experiencing not dissimilar treatment. You, you think you would hope that we had moved on. And in lots of ways we have, but it's still it's still there. And I'm sure there will be examples of it as we go through the, the Euros competition, though I hope they will be um, less frequent. Um, oh, yes, this is just about the I don't know if you remember from um, the recent Olympics. The, the controversy around the Norway beach handball team who um, their prescribed kit is bikini style knickers and they refused to wear them and they wore cycling shorts style bottoms like their male um, the, the male team would and they and they were fined because they were not wearing the regulation kit and there was a whole discussion around whether you needed to be as a, as a female player whether you needed to be in a crop top and bikini knickers did that help your game or why could you not wear a vest or singlet with uh, cycling shorts as their male um, compatriots did? Um, so that sparked, you know, a lot of discussion around, you know, what is appropriate? What do you expect women to be playing? What is the role of women? Again, at the height of their sporting prowess. And yet they have these rather outdated ideas around them. So I mentioned uh, Mia earlier. She uh, this incredibly successful American uh, football player. Um, and I love her quote. I just think, you know, it's so true. You know, for so long, you know, running like a girl has been such a derogatory quote, but actually, you know, I think lots of men would uh, struggle to keep up with her. Again, it's sort of, it's that perception that the women's game is less, less physical, less, you know, has less a a athletic prowess to it. And in some ways is, is as a, you know, it's, comes off as a, as a second rate you know it's the it's the poor relation to the men's game when as we talked about at the beginning they're the same game with a different culture around them um, and in no way should the women's game be portray portrayed as something that's lesser than the men's game and hopefully with all the coverage that's around the women's euros um, that will go even further to, to rectifying that um, however uh, these are these are the most recent stats that i could find of all sports coverage in 2018, oh, only between four and 10% of media coverage of sport covered women's sport. The rest was men's sport. So you think, you know, when you talk about the accessibility, as I think we talked about at the beginning that from Asim's uh, comment, although that coverage was really positive, it's a really tiny, tiny amount. When you think of the huge amount of airtime that goes to male sports. So when you think of women who are coming up or girls who are looking to play sport now, if you can't see yourself there. How do you know that that is a career possibility for you or that it's a valid choice for you to make? So that sort of the media coverage in conjunction with the, the restrictions that happened during the ban um, have really affected the development of the female game. And I think this will come out in, in when you're talking to people. Um, and this is a quote from uh, one of my Sporting Heritage colleagues, Fiona Skillen, who's an academic based, based up at Glasgow Caledonian University. And, you know, she hit the nail on the head. It's been really nonlinear and uneven because of the support and the access to resources and funding and media coverage. Um, and as a result, how can you expect as heritage organisations to have that cohesive collection when the sport itself has has developed in this non, you know, hasn't had this organic development. It's had this very sort of stuttery start um, uh, history to it. So it's no, no surprise that, you know, people's collections are, are light when it comes to, to women's football. Lots of people are trying to address this. Uh, Manchester City ran a great campaign um, before the pandemic um, with a non-gendered approach. They, um, if you have a look on there, they've got a great short video where they're saying a goal is a goal. It doesn't matter if it's scored by a girl or scored by a boy. A goal is a goal. You should celebrate it, um, which is a fantastic campaign, I thought. Um, and for those of you who had the opportunity to go to the National Football Museum in Manchester, they now, over the last, I think it might be as much as five years now, have a 50-50 policy um, in their displays where they're working towards having 50% representation for the male game and 50% rep representation for the women's game. Um, and that's, that's prompted some really interesting discussions about how they change their collecting policies, how they change their interpretation, everything, their events programme, looking at who their audiences are, you know, it's a, it's a real wholesale change. 
So this this is the breaking news. I don't know if you saw this in the news yesterday. Um, I was very pleased when I came across this, not, not just because it's fantastic content for, for the webinar, but also for, for the women who've been involved in this campaign. So yesterday it was confirmed that the, the American women's football team will now receive equal pay and it's taken them six years for it. So equal pay with the men's team, equal split of prize money, equal split of everything right the way through. And they're the only team and you know, it's the, the only one in the world where we've got this. I'm hoping that this is the beginning of that domino effect where that pay gap between men's and women's sport will start to even out. Um, and there's a, a link to an article in the New York Times. Um, and obviously there was huge celebration. And, you know, for women, that's it's the difference between being able to be a professional player and having to play and still work. Um, you know, you can you can be a professional and still be having to find other ways to, to bring your income in. But if you're playing at elite level, you should be able to be able to play and be supported um, financially and with all the other resources that are required um, in the same way that your uh, male comrades are. So um, that was a real breakthrough for the US women's football team. So moving on from the treatment of women into this idea around community cohesion. Um, these are some examples about uh, from Liverpool. So this is part of the Wondrous Place Gallery at Liverpool Museum. Um, where they look at all the things that make Liverpool a fantastic place to be, to live, to visit. And obviously a key part of that is football. And you can see how they've just added it in. It's not displayed in isolation. It's added in with all the other topics. It's interpreted in a way and they talk about it in a way. So you can see how it links out to other topics that make the city um, a fantastic place to be. Um, and there, if you watch that YouTube video, there's somebody doing a guided tour of it. So um, the jacket, just for information, so the jacket on the um, right is the one that belonged to Bill Shankly and the jacket, the annotated jacket at the bottom is linked to the Hillsborough disaster. So they cover all aspects of Liverpool's history, um, but it's not, you know, it's not in a sports specific space. It's in with all the other fantastic things that make Liverpool a great place to be. Another example of showing how sport is that sort of golden thread that runs through communities. This is actually a tennis example. So this is from Wakefield Museum and it's their Playmakers exhibition, which sadly was a temporary exhibition. It's not on anymore. Um, but this was all about um, the Sykes company or William Sykes and his company who became part of the Slashinger group. So they produced sporting equipment and then went out all over the world and it employed um, masses and masses of local people. So it was a real, you know, it brought income into the town. People were proud that they were making this fantastic sports equipment that was going um, elsewhere. As a businessman, he was supporting the development of the town. So it has all sorts of social history um, implications. And there are two um, rather nice blogs written about how sport and the community sort of all go together on the Wakefield website. And then I think the last one is this uh, in our community cohesion section is this one from Mansfield. So this is the story of sport in Mansfield. Um, and again, it's looking at how all these amazing sports have all come together in one time. And this, this one in particular was linked with participation. So not only are they saying how fantastic it is to have all these sports come together just in one town, but I, as far as I am aware, they linked with all the different clubs that were providing these sports, so then people could go and try them as well. So I know that a number of the host cities are giving opportunities for girls and young women to try football and football coaching as part of their heritage offer. Um, is anybody doing that who's on the call today? Do you know if there are practical activities going alongside your, your heritage roles? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, there's basically it was like kind of like doing keepy uppies and like trying to like doing taking part in like the VAR or kind of like video assistant reviews past past matches. So see if that's kind of like trying to get people like to understand how to come what the game's about and also trying to keep mm. people more more engaged as well. Yeah. Hmm. Because it's it's one thing to go and see static pictures or, or even moving footage of a game but unless you you know with sport you need to, to 
fully experience it, you either need to go to a match or you need to participate in it to get that real understanding of it, don't you? So mm -hmm. I think being able to link, you know, a cultural offer with participation, whether you're as a player or as a fan, um, no. is a fantastic way to go. And that's what they did in this, in this exhibition in Mansfield. So these mm. community cohesion examples really sort of bring together um, some of the key things that, that sport does really well. Sport can underpin sort of that idea of citizenship, you know, encourages tolerance, it encourages respect and sort of equal um, equality between players. It encourages cooperation and problem solving and trusting others and being able to bring that together within a community and a town, it, it, it sort of really supports that sort of idea of you know, citizenship. Um, the other thing that I really like about um, sort of the sporting analogy, which actually came from a, a gentleman who I worked with on a cricketing project, is that idea, of, particularly in team sports, that you need to be both a team player. So you need to understand the dynamics of a team, but you also need to have your individual skills as well. So you have to be that sort of it's two sides of the same coin. You need to be a team player, but you also need to have those strong individual skills. And I think you see that with sportsmen with that sort of determination they have when they go on to do things in later life that are outside of their sporting field and if you think if you've got that within your community that's you know can only be a benefit so there are community cohesion examples moving on to equality diversity and inclusion i'm just going to see how we're doing on time doing okay so this is an example of an exhibition that was held um in uh, Norwich or around Owen oh, Thetford sorry um, at the Ancient House Museum um, and they worked with a their teen history club to look at different LGBTQ plus stories within their collections um, that had been hidden so it's all around that idea of um, revealing hidden histories now does anybody know who the footballer at the bottom is student fashion no. yeah, yeah John just of the fashion of the yeah so they had, he has a link with Thetford and they had one of his scarves in the exhibition. Um, so again, it's not having sport in isolation, it's linking sport out to a wider topic and linking to all these other sort of themes that fit in with that LGBTQ theme that they were looking as part of their exhibition. Obviously, again, this week, there's been some, um, you know, groundbreaking news uh, around, oh, I'll talk about Watford in a moment. About this chap, you seen him in the news? So this yeah. is Jake Daniels from Blackpool. So he's the first openly gay uh, professional footballer since um, Fashion New came out 30 years ago, which, you know, I know they've been talking about that it's going to happen at some point, but, you know, he's, he's very young, isn't he? He's, what, 17? So, you know, it's, it's a big step forward when there are um, players probably in a far more... Um, senior or you know influential position who who choose not to um just going back to that uh the one that i jumped over which is watford museum they do a lot of community work and one of the community projects that they work on is with the proud hornets which is the lgbtq um element of watford football club um and if you're interested in that it's worth looking at their work as well now sort of Dipping off from uh, the equality theme, just briefly, just to talk about role models. And again, this sort of comes back to that idea of pioneers that we had both with Lily Parr and Julia Lee at the beginning. Um, I know that having read the stuff um, around Jake Daniels, he said that one of the people that he was inspired by role model wise for coming out were people like Tom Daly, who's up in the top right hand corner and um, an Australian player who had come out not that long ago. So it's, you can never underestimate how important sporting role models can be. And they don't have to be, you know, these people that we all know about. It can be somebody within your local community who has really championed, you know, you or your club or the skills. And I'm hoping that as part of this, um, the Women's Euros project, some of these role models will, will come out. So, I mean, obviously, almost everybody on the screen there has had some form of celebrity endorsement. I could probably run a webinar on its own about David Beckham's on uh, just on their own. It seems to be linked to everything and everything. But they've used their celebrity, all of them, for good work. They're all ambassadors for various charities. 
Um, and obviously, uh, one of the reasons why I chose that picture of Tom Daly is uh, he's caused quite a, good, a stir in the knitting community with his uh, knitting at poolside. So, you know, people are interested in their lives, but in a positive way. So trying to, again, trying to challenge the sort of preconceptions that sometimes, you know, the negative preconceptions sometimes around sports and sports people. You know, there's a whole raft of role models out there who continue to uh, inspire even people at elite levels, let alone at the grassroots levels that we're going to be um, possibly working with as part of this project. So just going back, diving back into the equality, diversion, diversity and inclusion topic, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about disability. Do people know the, the women on the screen there? Shout out if you know. Anybody recognise them? Yeah, that's, that's half, isn't it? Yeah, Dame Sarah Story. Mm -hmm. um, Tammy Gray. Thompson, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. That's all three. Yeah. So Hannah Cockcroft, yeah. Sarah Story, Dame Sarah Story, and Tammy Gray Thompson. Um, it will come as no surprise that talking about the historic, the sporting historical record, that disability sports is massively, massively underrepresented and underrecorded. Um, we're slowly developing an understanding of disability and in particular women's disability sports. Um, and as part of Sporting Heritage, we've had funding from Sport England to particularly do a piece of work around this and just try and map where women's um, sport and women's disability sport is at the moment and what's being recorded. And um, we're very pleased to have worked both with Hannah and with Sarah um, on elements of this. And you can actually um, hear, we've had some, uh, did some interviewing with them. Um, and they're the links to their stories there. But just picking up on a, a couple of points that they've made, particularly with Hannah Cockcroft. Um, she, well, there's two things with Hannah. So the, one of the two stories that I wanted to mention, particularly with her, is that she, you know, she started off her, her sporting career um, almost by accident. She, although her parents are very supportive of her, when she didn't really play sport, and it's only when she met another disabled student um, and he said, oh, what sport do you play? And she said, well, we don't, we do other things. And he took her and they started playing basketball. So she started to play basketball and seated discus. And it's through the success with um, her seated discus performance that she met Tanny Gray Thompson's husband, who gave her the opportunity to try wheelchair racing at Loughborough. And then that's the beginning of her wheelchair racing career. She cites Tanny Gray Thompson as a, a real role model for her. But, you know, much as we know about Tanny's racing career, she raced against lots of other women to be the elite sports person that she is. But there, a lot of their sporting history is lost along the way. And I think, you know, that's that's true of so much of women's sport, let alone the disability sport. You know about key players, but actually the wider stories um, are lost. Um, just trying to think oh yes yeah, so they were the two things yes that she, she she'd initially been told that sports wasn't necessarily for her um and yes that those wider stories were being lost but i would highly recommend that the in conversations normally are less than half an hour um and they both speak you know brilliantly they're both great uh public speakers so i would highly recommend um going and listening to those if you have the opportunity so moving on looking at religious beliefs um, I don't know if any of you recognise this lady. This is uh, Dana Abdul Karim, who plays for England Rounders. Um, she is the first Muslim and Arab player to, comp uh, to compete um, at uh, national and international level. She's got 67 caps and now coaches. Um, and she talks about how she started off. Actually, I think she started off playing football, but unfortunately, the contact nature of football as a sport wasn't compatible with her um, Muslim beliefs. So therefore, she needed to find um, a sport that was compatible with her beliefs. She wanted to continue that. It goes back to that idea that, you know, you're a sports person and you, I mean, a bit like Sarah Story's changed sports, hasn't she? She started as a swimmer and is now um, a cyclist. Dana started playing a different sport to the one that she's made her career in. But for her, the change was around her, her religion. Um, and again, there's, a, there's an in-conversation with her. She speaks brilliantly. She now teaches um, PE and PSHE at secondary school level and is involved um, in sports at, um, uh, at a very sort of senior level. 
um, and speaks. She's a really motivational speaker. But again, there are all sorts of reasons why people play and don't play sport or, or they have to change their sporting activity. It's always worth investigating that. I know sometimes it's difficult to talk to people about their sort of belief systems. But that's just one example of how somebody who really wanted to play changed to keep that sports element um, alive in their life. And then I think this might be the last one on this topic, which is looking at racism. It's a massive thing within football, both within the men's game, um, and I hope less so within the women's game, but it, you see how, how rife it is within the men's game. And obviously there is the massive kick it out campaign within the men's game. But there's also some fantastic projects trying to recognize um, people of color within uh, the game. So I just thought I'd give you a couple of examples here. So the Know Their Names project is a, a partnership project between the National Football Museum and primary schools and an organization called Every Color and looking at um, black footballers. Um, Football's Black Pioneers, which is the book cover, uh, the green book cover at the top, um, looks at, uh, this looks at the male game, but looks at the first black players across, um, I think it's the, all the premiership clubs, but uh, looks across uh, a whole raft of football clubs and just records their history. And it, it's interesting to see when each of the clubs had their first uh, black player. Then there's organisations like FERD, which is Football Unites Races and Desi uh, Divides, which looks at breaking down those barriers. Um, there's also a fantastic, uh, really quite emotional video on the Scottish uh, Football Association site which looks at how they brought together this united glasgow fc team which is bringing um refugees together who again it's bringing together for that shared experience they've come from all over the world to uh settle in glasgow and the one thing that brings them together is a game of football and there's a there's quite a quite a, an emotive film on the scottish football association so they're just some some ideas about how racism has been tackled hopefully it won't be something that really um, you have to contend with too much um, in too much depth uh, within the Women's Euros project, but it's uh, entirely possible that it, that it will crop up. Um, so I hope those resources will be of some use. So moving on to our final topic, which is health and well-being. I think in the, the Sporting Heritage film, um, Paul Goodman from Yorkshire Cricket talked about how good sports are when the work around reminiscence and dementia. Um, and Football Memory Scotland have done some fantastic work um, putting together memory boxes. Um, and as far as I know, they've worked mainly with male clubs, but there's no reason why they couldn't be equally applicable to the women's game. Um, Sporting Heritage as an organisation have put together a handbook around best practice around reminiscence and dementia. So if anybody's looking at a good guide about how you use that within a sporting context, I would recommend that. Um, around bullying, there's lots and lots of sporting examples of where people have acted kindly um, to others on the sports pitch and stopped the play um, or gone and helped uh, a colleague, even if it meant it's had a detrimental effect on them. The, one a couple of examples that always spring to mind for me are the Brownlee brothers where one of them was lagging behind and the other brother stopped to help him over the line because his, his legs were giving out underneath him I don't know if any of you remember that clip um, and then not that long ago when um, Ericsson from Tottenham had the heart attack on the pitch I don't know if any of you watched that match and the rest of the other players stood around him so there was privacy for him and all the medics to actually work on him on the pitch rather than there being that 24 hour rolling news. So it's those sportsmen stepping in to help others. And that's I think that links in with sort of the one kind word campaign and anti-bullying and just showing again, it's coming up to those ideas of citizenship and fairness and equality that, that sports can really have in spades. And I'm hoping that obviously there'll be some examples through the Women's Euros for those. Then finally, on the health and well-being um, topic on this slide, anyway, I've got one more slide after this, is the link between um, playing sport and people's mental health. 
And obviously that's something we've seen in spades during the pandemic, how actually getting out and playing sport or be just being out in the open air is so good for your mental health. Um, but the Scottish FA have done uh, a fantastic series of films um, all labelled up as Football Save My Life. Quite a few of them are around young female players. Um, and the one that I've picked out there is Isla Buchanan's story, where football really saved her from having a really dark mental time where she got as close as, as thinking about taking her own life. But actually, the thing that made her hang on in there was her regular football practice. <coughs> Excuse me. So the final one on our health and well-being topic is this example um, from the National Portrait Gallery in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Um, they have this picture at the top, the Charles Martin Hardy of curling being played, and they wanted to encourage participation. And they wanted to do an event that encouraged participation, linking in with this picture that had recently been restored and was on loan to them. So they worked with um, Scottish curling to actually have curling in the Great Hall. So it's putting into uh, a traditional, possibly considered highbrow organisation, a sport that is accessible and giving people the opportunity to have that participation. So it's the, the bringing together of two juxtaposed um, activities. Um, and you could actually do the curling in front of the picture. Um, and apparently it was very, very successful. Um, so it's just that those sort of ideas, and we've already talked about sort of incorporating participation, but the effect that it has on people's mental well-being, and hopefully for young girls that are coming into the game, that will really underpin um, their participation going forwards. So these are the links um, to that project, uh, which I hope will be a useful uh resource and talking about yeah brokering partnerships between heritage organizations and sporting organizations so i think that brings me to the end of quite a whistle stop tour of the second half we've got only a few minutes to go so i think my next slide i hope you can see that what i've tried to uh demonstrate with a raft of examples is that sport can really be a golden thread that connects people, places and communities. Um, I'm going to stop the slide deck there so that I can see everybody. Has anybody got any questions um, or anything they want to talk about, you know, off the back of any of those items? I hope that's been useful for you. I've stunned you into silence. Sorry, it's a lot of me talking and you listening. <laughs> so. Unless there are any final questions, I'd just like to thank you for listening to me this afternoon and I hope um, that's been useful and I really look forward to seeing how all your projects progress um, and how they come to fruition over the summer. Thank you very much.